Thank you, Dr. Rosinski. Let me just make sure I know that this is the right side. Okay. Aha. It is, in fact. Okay. All right. As the lightning thief begins, 12-year-old Percy Jackson explains his family situation. He has a kind and devoted mother, Sally, and a world-class jerk of a stepfather named, nicknamed Smelly Gabe because the guy reeks like moldy garlic pizza wrapped in gym shorts. Percy says of his biological father, I don't have any memories of him, just this sort of warm glow, maybe the barest trace of a smile. My mom doesn't like to talk about him because it makes her sad. She has no pictures. See, they weren't married. She told me he was rich and important and their relationship was a secret. Then one day, he set sail across the Atlantic on some important journey and he never came back. Lost at sea, my mom told me. Not dead, lost at sea. Lost at sea, it turns out, was his mother's code for his father being the Greek god Poseidon. When Percy learns of his lineage, he also discovers that he must go across, uh, on a cross-country, monster-ridden quest to find Zeus's mon master bolt, restore the honor of the father whom he has never met, and prevent a war so big it'll make the Trojan War look like a water balloon fight. Before the quest even begins, Percy has battled a fury disguised as his math teacher, lost his mother to the Minotaur, been attacked by a hellhound, and abandoned at a greyhound station on the Upper East Side by the one living adult he trusts, who he's recently learned is not a human Latin teacher, but the mythical centaur trainer of heroes, Chiron. As he waits for the bus, he admits to himself, and this is number two on your handout, the truth was, I didn't care about retrieving Zeus's lightning bolt, or saving the world, or even helping my father out of trouble. The more I thought about it, I resented Poseidon for never visiting me, never helping my mom, never even sending a lousy child support check. He'd only claimed me because he needed a job done. As the series progresses, and there are five books in total in the series, we learn that this is the common lament of the half-blood, immortal parents are indifferent to their mortal children. In a flashback in the final book of the series, The Last Olympian, Luke, Percy's chief half-blood adversary, says to his immortal father, Hermes, and this is number three, a father is supposed to be around. I've never even met you. In many ways, this in fact becomes the common lament of all children, even immortal ones. In fact, the plot of the Percy Jackson and the Olympian series centers around an adversarial parent-child relationship, for it chronicles a modern titanomachy, the mythical battle of the Olympians, led by Zeus, against the original bad father, Cronus. Hades points out that while the Olympians may bicker, if there's one thing that they agree on, it's that Cronus was a terrible father. In his contemporary titanomachy, the tables have turned, and the titans, the parents, are rising against the Olympians, the children. Raiden extends this plot device, and it becomes an overarching theme of the entire series, encompassing several generations and reusing various ancient myths to pose questions about the relationship between parents and children. Today, I will be coupling this theme with a more theoretical discussion about the reception of classical text. In the introduction to Classics and the Uses of Reception, edited by Charles Martindale and Richard Thomas, Martindale remarks, number four, Antiquity and modernity, present and past, are always implicated in each other, always in dialogue. To understand either one, you need to think of the other. He then explains that he prefers the term reception to tradition because it underscores the active and reciprocal connection between ancient and modern. Royden is not merely borrowing from antiquity, rather he's engaged in a dynamic exchange with ancient authors. Knowledge of mythology not only enhances an understanding of Royden's creations, but also Percy Jackson inevitably colors our understanding of ancient texts. Today, oh, oh no. Oh, there we go. Um, 
Today, I'd, I'm interested in, two, in the two extant Homeric epics, the Iliad and the Odyssey, which are products of archaic Greece, and the first century BC, uh, BCE Roman epic, the Aeneid by Virgil. I'm going to focus on the three main ways that I see Riordan reusing classics in general, and these texts in particular. The first is that he uses them to treat distinctly modern themes and issues. Secondly, to treat age-old themes or issues that are visible in the ancient text, but from a modern perspective. And thirdly, as a corrective, to fix past versions to be in, more con to be in concert with modern beliefs. Royden claims not to have any particular message he wants to convey to his young readers, and nor to his older adult readers, for that matter. On his website, he states, I don't consciously put messages in the books, because my job is telling a good story, not preaching. Yet as Mernigan in Classics for Cool Kids, popular and unpopular versions of antiquity for children, and Maury and Nelson in their forthcoming A God Buys Us Cheeseburgers, Rick Royden's Percy Jackson series and Education's Culture Wars point out, Royden's Teacher's Guide and website for educators belie this claim. Um, and this is just a screenshot of the website. If you've never, if you're a fan of the series and you've never been to his website, it, uh, it's very rich. It has a lot of information on it. So Royden offers a, a set of questions for each of the first three novels in the Percy Jackson series that follow Bloom's taxonomy beginning with knowledge-based questions about the plot of the book and extending to questions requiring personal reflection on what constitutes moral conduct. Indeed, Royden states in an interview, I do pick up on themes from Greek mythology that still resonate in the modern world. One episode jumps out as particularly clever satire that illustrates how Royden uses classical mythology as commentary on modern annals. And here, I'm going to deviate from the theme of parent-child relationships, so just please indulge me. This is my favorite episode in the entire series. Um, so in the Battle of the Labyrinth, the fourth book in the series, Annabeth, who's the daughter of Athena, has a run-in with the Sphinx. Percy narrates, then I saw the monster. She had the body of a huge lion and the head of a woman. She would have been pretty, but her hair was tied back into a tight bun and she wore too much makeup, so she kind of reminded me of my third grade choir teacher. She had a blue ribbon badge pinned to her chest that took me a moment to read. This monster has been rated exemplary. Fabulous prizes, the Sphinx said. Pass the test and you get to advance. Fail and I get to eat you. Welcome, Annabeth Chase, the monster cried. Are you ready for your test? Yes, she said. Ask your riddle. 20 riddles, actually, the Sphinx said gleefully. We've raised our standards. To pass, you must show proficiency in all 20. Isn't that great? A drum roll sounded from above. The Sphinx's eyes glittered with excitement. What is the capital of Bulgaria? Annabeth frowned. Sophia, she said, but correct. The Sphinx smiled so wide her fame showed. Please be sure to mark your answers clearly on your test with a number two pencil. What? Annabeth looked mystified. Then a test booklet appeared on the podium in front of her, along with a sharpened pencil. Make sure you bubble each answer clearly and stay inside the circle, the Sphinx said. If you have to erase, erase completely, or the machine will not be able to read your answers. Now second question, what is the square root of 16? Four, Annabeth said, but correct. What US president signed the Emancipation Proclamation? Abraham Lincoln, but these aren't riddles. Of course they are. This test material is specially designed. It's just a bunch of dumb random facts, Annabeth insisted. Riddles are supposed to make you think. Think, the Sphinx frowned. How am I supposed to test whether you can think? That's ridiculous. This is a stupid test. I won't answer these questions. Why then, my dear, the monster said calmly, if you won't pass, you fail. And since we can't allow any children to be held back, you'll be eaten. Can you tell that uh, before the success of Percy Jackson, Royden taught middle school in the era of No Child Left Behind? 
<laughs> published in 2008, this episode represents many teachers, parents, and even students' frustration with the prevalence of standardized testing. Royden has taken a tale that in its ancient version deals with clever thought to make a pointed critique of a modern education system uninterested in thinking. The ancient and modern versions share the motif of testing, which is what makes the modern version successful, but the sentiment is entirely contemporary. Royden does often play with classical mythology to reflect modern concerns, but he is equally likely to reuse myth to treat age-old themes that are also central to ancient texts. Recent scholarship on Percy Jackson and the Olympian series has either been from an educational standpoint, concentrating on its appeal for reluctant readers and celebration of children with dyslexia and ADHD, or from a nationalistic perspective, reading the book as teaching citizenship and defending Western civilization. The more personal angle seems largely to be ignored in scholarship. Yet these books, originally written for Royden's own children, have at their core the age-old struggle between parents unable to directly control their children's lives and children who feel abandoned by their distant parents. In the final book of the Percy Jackson and the Olympian series, and here I have to insert a spoiler alert if you haven't finished the series, I'm about to give away the big finale. Um, Percy turns down immortality in order to secure for other demigods recognition by their divine parents. At the end of the first book, The Lightning Thief, we learned that Luke, uh, Percy's main rival, turned to Cronus because he felt abandoned by his Olympian parents. He tells Percy, our fathers have done nothing for us. In the end, Luke has a change of faith, and he commits suicide to save Western civilization. But his dying request to Percy emphasizes his continued feelings of neglect. Percy narrates, he gripped my sleeve, and I could feel the heat of his skin like fire. Ethan, who's uh, another half-blood that had turned to Cronus after he felt rejected uh, by Olympus. Ethan, me, all the unclaimed. Don't let it, don't let it happen again. His eyes were angry, but pleading too. For his role in defeating Luke and Cronus, Zeus offers to make Percy a god. Percy refuses, asking instead, from now on, I want you to properly recognize the children of the gods, all the children of all the gods. Cronus couldn't have risen if it hadn't been for a lot of demigods who felt abandoned by their parents. They felt angry, resentful, and unloved, and they had good reason. All children of all the gods will be welcome and treated with respect. That is my wish. Indeed, the series centers on this omnipresent element of ancient epics, parents and children. Much scholarship has examined this a theme. For instance, in the case of the Iliad, in the 1963 book, The Descent from Heaven, Thomas Green calls the Iliad a great poem about fatherhood. Louise Pratt, in her 2007 article, The Parental Ethos, argues, from the beginning to the end, the Iliad sustains a coherent vision of parental devotion and the centrality of parent-child relationships. Indeed, uh, oh no, there we are, all right. Indeed, the Iliad begins with one of the most poignant of all parent-child scenes in ancient literature. Agamemnon has taken Achilles Geras, uh, his spoils of war. In this case, the girl named Briseis. Achilles had wanted to kill Agamemnon for this action, but Athena stops him. Achilles withdraws to the shore and calls upon his divine mother. But Achilles, and this is number nine, but Achilles, having burst into tears, was sitting on the shore of the gray sea, having withdrawn from his companions, looking at the boundless deep sea. And he prayed many things to his own mother, stretching out his hands. Mother, since you bore me to be so short-lived, Olympian Zeus, the high thundering, ought to bestow upon me honor at least. But now he honors me not even a little. For the son of Atreus, Agamemnon, who rules widely and has dishonored me, for he, having seized my prize, he now holds it. He himself has deprived me. Thus he spoke, pouring forth a tear 
and his revered mother, sitting in the depths of the sea beside her aged father, hears him. At once, just as the mist does, she emerged from the gray sea and sat beside him as he poured forth tears and stroked his hand, and she addressed him. My child, why has grief come to your heart? Speak, do not conceal it in your mind that we both may know. Achilles explains that the Greeks had angered Apollo by taking the daughter of one of his priests as a prize for Agamemnon, and that once they found out the only way to escape the wrath of Apollo, which comes in the form of a plague, was to return the girl. Agamemnon decided to return the girl, but he also takes Achilles' prize as recompense. Achilles asked his mother to convince Zeus to punish Agamemnon. Thetis responds in tears, and this is number 10. Oh, alas, my child, why did I give birth to you for sorrow and raise you for sorrow? Would that you were sitting by the ships, tearless and unharmed, since your life is for so short a time, not very long at all. But as at as it is, you are fated to die early and miserable above all. Thetis, telling Achilles to withdraw from the war, agrees to ask Zeus for aid. This scene is indeed full of pathos and tenderness. Thetis speaks openly, honestly, plainly to her son of his heart-rending faith. The first meeting of Aeneas and Venus, uh, who's Aeneas's divine mother in the Aeneid, is in pointed and purposeful contrast, emphasizing the inevitable power difference and barrier between immortal parent and mortal child. It too is poignant, but for an altogether different reason. Aeneas, shipwrecked near Carthage in northern Africa, goes exploring with his companion, Akates. A young woman appears to them, dressed as a huntress, asking if they have seen any of her sisters. Aeneas immediately recognizes that the woman is divine, but he does not know which goddess she is. And this is 11. O oh, maiden, how should I address you? For scarcely is your face mortal, nor does your voice sound human. O oh, truly a goddess, perhaps the sister of Phoebus or one of the blood of nymphs. The woman, denying that she is divine, tells Aeneas about the history of the queen of Carthage, Dido, in order that he may safely visit her. Then Aeneas is surprised. Number 12. She spoke, and turning, she shone with a rosy complexion, and from her head her hair smelled of the divine odor of ambrosia. Her dress flowed down to her feet, and from her walk it became obvious that she was truly a goddess. That man, when he recognized his mother, pursued her with such a voice. Why do you, cruel one, taunt your son so often in pretend guises? Why is it not allowed for us to join hands and to hear and to speak to one another in our true voices? The adverb, totiens, so often, is particularly heartbreaking as it suggests that Venus rarely appears to her son as herself. She protects him, but only from a distance. If we asked Percy to read the Iliad and the Aeneid, he would probably identify himself with the remoteness Aeneas feels rather than the intimacy of Achilles' relationship. This connection with Aeneas stands true in other respects. Of course, Homer is hugely influential and pervasive, but Royden himself remarks, I get letters from college kids who have read Percy Jackson when they were younger who tell me, I just passed my classics exam. The books are accurate enough that they can serve as a gateway to Homer and to Virgil. And I, I don't know what's more upsetting about that quote, which is that it implies that college students are just reading Percy Jackson and not reading Homer and Virgil, or that he's, he's uh, using drug terminology to talk about classics. I'm not sure which I'm more upset by. But it doesn't matter. He mentions Virgil. All right. In fact, there are many superficial similarities between the two works. A destiny and duty-bound fugitive hero with a largely distant immortal parent shepherds a group on a difficult east-to-west journey with a stop in the underworld to visit their recently deceased mortal parent. I would also argue that Percy's devotion to his family and companions and his sublimation of his fears and desires for the good of the group are more closely akin to Aeneas 
than to any Homeric warrior, but all of that is for another talk. To return to Percy and his father, when Percy meets Poseidon for the first time, he says, and this is number 13, I wasn't sure what I saw in his face. There was no clear sign of love or approval. I got the feeling Poseidon didn't really know what to think of me. He didn't know whether he was happy to have me as a son or not. Percy concludes, in a strange way, I was glad that Poseidon was so distant. He appreciates that his interaction with Poseidon, unlike Aeneas's meeting with Venus, doesn't feel fake. This meeting, although it's lacking in closeness, shares a common theme with Achilles and Thetis's meeting, and that is the unhappy fate of heroes. Poseidon shares a very similar sentiment with Percy, number 14. I'm sorry you were born, child. I have brought you a hero's fate, and a hero's fate is never happy. It is never anything but tragic. Percy responds, I tried not to feel hurt. Here was my own dad telling me he was sorry that I'd been born. I don't mind, father. Not yet, perhaps, he said. Not yet. But it was an unforgivable mistake on my part. Percy has yet to fully understand the prophecy that surrounds his birth. And unlike Achilles' response to his mother, Percy's father's comments hurt him to the quick. And I have to say that since reading The Lightning Thief, I've often wondered why Thetis' uh, remarks don't uh, hurt Achilles more. For Percy, however, his bond with his mother, his mortal parent, is foremost. Although Percy's mother is killed, um, in a sense, by the Minotaur and 53 pages into the books, she is his moral touchstone and his motivation. He goes on a quest to rescue her, not to help his father. He is jarred out of the Lotus Casino by concern for her, and he is ultimately forced to leave her in the underworld. He states, I turned and faced my mother. I desperately wanted to sacrifice myself and use the last pearl on her, but I knew what she would say. She would never allow it. I had to get the bolt back to Olympus and tell Zeus the truth. I had to stop the war. She would never forgive me if I saved her instead. Sally may appear only at the beginning and the ending of The Lightning Thief, but she is Percy's anchor, the one that influences his decisions. Likewise, while Anchises, who's Aeneas's father, only appears alive in the flashbacks of books two and three of the Aeneid, he also appears as a ghost in book six, his presence looms large over Aeneas. Joseph Farrell refers to Anchises as Aeneas' moral compass, and as Aeneas begins his journey, he looks to Anchises for guidance and for reassurance. And yet it is only after Anchises' death that Aeneas fully becomes the leader of the exiled Trojans. While these mortal-mortal relationships seem predominant in both Percy Jackson and the Aeneid, both immortal parents, Venus and Poseidon, are working behind the scenes. Farrell, in his analysis of Aeneid 5, explains, number 16, Obviously, the relationship between Aeneas' parents and his own relationship to each of them is wildly asymmetrical. Venus is a goddess and the ancestress of the Roman people. Anchises is but one of many consorts, and thus much less important to the goddess than the fruit of their union. Aeneas' obsession with his father may blind him to the fact that it is his mother who helps him at every turn, who actually controls his destiny. Venus acts on Aeneas' behalf in nearly every book of the Aeneid. And this is, uh, the list is on uh, number 17. In book one, she asks Jupiter why the Trojans have been shipwrecked, and she protects Aeneas from any harm that may come from Juno manipulating Dido. In book two, she helps Aeneas escape from Troy as it is falling. In book five, she asks Neptune to give Aeneas safe passage. In book six, she guides Aeneas to the Golden Bough. In book eight, she brings him a new shield. In book 10, she asks that she at least be able to protect Ascanius, Aeneas' son. In book 12, she heals Aeneas' wound from an arrow in this picture. And she tells him the opportune moment to attack the Rutulians. The reader is privy to her actions because the narration is third-person omniscient. If the entire Aeneid were like books two and three of the Aeneid, narrated by Aeneas, who we learn is not the most reliable of interpreters. 
we would have a very different view of Venus. And indeed, this is what's happening in the lightning thief. Percy narrates the story from his limited perspective. Only on rare occasions do we learn of Poseidon's behind the scene machinations. The list is number 18. Chiron gives Percy a magical pen sword. Uh, it's a pen that turns into a sword, uh, which is from his father at the start of his quest. Percy battles Echidna and Chimera on the top of uh, the St. Louis Arch while trying to protect mortals. He is wounded and nearing death. In desperation, he drums, jumps from the arch into the Mississippi River, praying, Father, help me. He miraculously survives and is visited by the image of a Nereid who tells him, your father believes in you. In Santa Monica, he is given pearls from his father to help him escape the underworld and the message that his father is following him. And when Percy visits Olympus, Poseidon protects him from Zeus's wrath. Percy may not fully understand this, but the fact is his father is active, not absent. While immortal parents may work behind the scenes to keep their mortal children safe, there are occasions when they can no longer help. In a particularly moving scene in the Iliad, Zeus watches his mortal son Sarpedon battle Patroclus with the knowledge that Sar Sarpedon will lose. He laments to Hera, woe to me. It is fated that Sarpedon, dearest to me of men, be laid low by Patroclus, son of Menoetius. I am torn in two. My heart vies with my mind, thinking whether I shall place him still alive in the fertile land of Lycia, away from tearful battle, or whether I shall lay him low through the hand of the son of Menoetius. Hera replies that if Zeus should save his son, other gods would inevitably follow suit, and there would be grave consequences. Zeus accedes. Thus she spoke, nor did the father of both gods and men ignore her, but he poured forth bloody drops upon the ground, honoring his own son. And in Zeus, in this scene, must weigh the long-term consequences of his actions against his short-term benefit. Hermes attempts to deliver this very message to Percy in the second book, The Sea of Monsters. He says, Percy, the hardest part about being a god is that you must often act indirectly, especially when it comes to your own children. If we were to intervene every time our children had a problem, well, that would only create more problems and more resentment. But I believe if you give it some thought, you will see that Poseidon has been paying attention to you. Although the message is couched in terms of immortal, mortal parent-child relationships, the thrust is still true for mortal, mortal relationships as well. Part of being a parent, be you mortal or immortal, is recognizing when you must let your children fail or make a mistake, whether it is because the repercussions would affect the wider world or more simply because your child will benefit from the experience. Parents cannot directly control their children's lives. Children have to be free to fight their own monsters. Without those experiences, they will be ill-equipped to face what is to come. Parents must give their children opportunities to make choices, even if it means that the child uh, feels like they have been abandoned. This message of Hermes is equally pointed towards children, Children may feel that their parent has abandoned them. Parents make mistakes. Parents are distant. But at the same time, a child's perception of the larger picture may be incomplete. There are often extenuating circumstances of which they are unaware. This is certainly the case for both Percy and for Luke. Percy has no idea what his father is facing, which is a major battle under the sea. And Luke has no idea what has happened between his father and his mother. Hermes concludes, number 22, families are messy. Immortal families are eternally messy. Sometimes the best we can do is to remind each other that we're related, for better or for worse, and try to keep the maiming and killing to a minimum. The takeaway message is that most parents and children are trying their best and need to be afforded the benefit of the doubt. In the final chapter of The Lightning Thief, Luke holds Percy between life and death, asking him, number 23, didn't you realize how useless it all is? 
all the heroics being the pawns of the gods. They should have been overthrown thousands of years ago, but they've hung on thanks to us half-bloods. Percy responds, Luke, you're talking about our parents. Luke laughs and asks, that's supposed to make me love them? And the message of the book is, yes, it is. At the end of The Lightning Thief, Percy must decide what kind of hero he wants to be. Like Odysseus, Percy contemplates his harrowing journey, uh, completes his harrowing journey, and his return is complicated by an unwanted, drunken, gambling, threatening presence in his home. Percy's Nostos, his homecoming, in the penultimate chapter provides a corrective of ancient epics in two ways. And in this case, I don't mean corrective in the Bloomian anxiety of influence. Royden isn't trying to one-up Homer or Virgil. Instead, he's trying to make an unsettling element of the Iliad, the Odyssey, and the Aeneid more palatable for a modern and younger audience. All three epics conclude with rather ghastly, though perfectly explicable murders. Achilles kills Hector in a parallel scene. Aeneas pitilessly kills Turnus, despite his father's directive that he should spare the humbled. And Odysseus slaughters the suitors. These final killings are largely in keeping with an ancient heroic code of conduct. Let us remember that both Achilles and Aeneas were at war, and that Odysseus' home had been violated. Yet, for a modern reader, they remain particularly unsettling. It is clear that something bad must happen to Smelly Gabe, who blames Percy for the destruction of his precious Camaro and the disappearance of his slightly less precious wife. When Percy is about to descend to the underworld, which, uh, by the way, if you haven't read the book, is uh, analogous, it's in Los Angeles, which cracks me up. Um, he catches a glimpse of a Barbara Walters interview with Gabe. She was interviewing him in our apartment. This is number 24 in the middle of a poker game, and there was a young blonde lady sitting next to him, patting his hand. A fake tear glistened on his cheek. He was saying, honest, Mrs. Walters, if it wasn't for sugar here, my grief counselor, I'd be a wreck. My stepson took everything I cared about. Obviously, Gabe must go. An opportunity is presented to Percy. Earlier in The Lightning Thief, Percy had killed Medusa, and searching for parental acknowledgement, he had sent her severed head to his father in Olympus. When, Perseus returns home, when Percy returns home, he finds the same package in his room marked return to sender. Yet Royden has a problem here. Percy, unlike his epic predecessors, cannot kill a mortal. First of all, he's a 12-year-old boy, and no matter what else he has done, a 12-year-old boy cannot kill his stepfather, even after he discovers he has been beating his mother. Percy's ancient namesake, Perseus, may have been able to use Medusa's head to rescue his mother by turning the evil king Polydectes to stone, but the modern Percy is held to a different code of ethics and constrained by its genre. Number 25, I looked at my mother. Mom, do you want Gabe gone? Percy, it, it isn't that simple. I'm, Mom, just tell me. That jerk has been hitting you. Do you want him gone or not? She hesitated, then nodded almost imperceptibly. Yes, Percy, I do. And I'm trying to get up my courage to tell him. But you can't do this for me. You can't solve my problems. I looked at the box. I could solve her problem. I wanted to slice that package open, plop it on the poker table, and take out what was inside. I could start my very own statue garden right there in the living room. That's what a Greek hero would do in the stories, I thought. That's what Gabe deserves. But a hero's story always ended in tragedy. Poseidon had told me that. I remembered the underworld. I thought about Gabe's spirit drifting forever in the fields of Asphodel, or condemned to some hideous torture behind the barbed wire of the fields of Asphodel, uh, of the barbed wire of the fields of punishment, an eternal poker game, sitting up to his waist in boiling oil, listening to opera music. Did I have the right to send someone there? Even Gabe? A month ago, I wouldn't have hesitated. Now, 
And in the end, Percy, unlike his epic predecessors, does not kill in anger. He does not exact revenge. This allows Ruidon a second corrective. Percy's mother is, in a way, able to save herself. Danae, the original Perseus's mother, had to rely on her son to save her. And Percy offers to do likewise. 26. You deserve better than this, Mom. You don't need, me to, uh, you don't need to protect me anymore by staying with Gabe. Let me get rid of him. But she refuses his offer. You sound so much like your father. He thought he could solve all my problems with a wave of his hand. But if my life is going to mean anything, I have to live it for myself. I can't let a god take care of me or my son. I have to find courage on my own. <clears throat> Percy leaves her the box, and we discover that Sally herself does turn Gabe to a stone, and she sells him to an art gallery in order to get money for college tuition. Sally has found the courage and been given a method for taking action. While the, plot, uh, while the plot closely parallels the myth of Perseus, the spirit, for me, is more reminiscent of the Odyssey. Throughout the Odyssey, we get glimpses of young Telemachus and faithful Penelope, ever plagued by the suitors. Telemachus uh, complains to a disguised Athena, number 27. Odysseus goes unseen, unheard, and to me, he leaves both pain and weeping, nor do I lamenting him groan for him alone, since now the gods have brought other rotten troubles for me. For as many elite men as there are ruling over Dolichium uh, and Same and wooded Zacynthus, and as many men as rule in rocky Ithaca, so many men court my mother and consume my house. And neither does she disown loathed marriage, nor is she able to make an end to this. But eating, they waste away my home. Soon, indeed, they will destroy even me, myself. This critique of Penelope is reminiscent of Percy's lack of understanding about why his mother stays with Smelly Gabe. Yet both mothers have a larger understanding of the world than their young sons and both are defiant in their own ways. Penelope's lone recourse is to trick them, and this is the story of how she promises to marry a suitor when she finishes weaving a burial shroud for Odysseus's aged father, but it unravels her work every night. And <clears throat> Sally uh, refuses to take Gabe's last name, which is horribly offensive to him. So just as Poseidon gives Percy the opportunity to kill Gabe, Athena, as Mentes, tells Telemachus that he must get rid of the suitors, though the motivation in this case is less altruistic than it, uh, Percy's. It's less to save his mother and more to protect his own inheritance. But neither Penelope nor Telemachus are capable of driving the suitors out of their home. They must wait for Odysseus to return. If we take Smelly Gabe and his poker pals as the suitors, in Royden's, village, uh, in Royden's version, Penelope is given a method of freeing herself. In a sense, it does require the aid of Percy as a Telemachus-Odysseus blend. But it still fulfills, if only at a surface level, a modern expectation that Percy's mother should be able to act for her own benefit. In this case, the mother is no longer dependent. I'd like to return to Royden's notion of the Percy Jackson series as a gateway to Virgil and to Homer. I disagree with this notion. Yes, young readers will probably begin with Percy and then turn to ancient works. But the path is not linear, nor is it one direction. Instead, the relationship between ancient and modern is more of a revolving door. Percy colors our understanding of ancient, work, ancient works just as much as knowledge of mythology shapes our reading of Percy. We are simultaneously made aware of our similarities and our differences with antiquity. Reception allows us to see these connections, that reuse is more than a competition between authors. In the case of Percy Jackson, Royden borrows widely, creating a pastiche of illusions from the Sphinx critiquing modern educational practices to scenes of parents and children in all their various iterations. Royden finds shared moments 
that allow these illusions to successfully create complexity and bring uh, to life questions of family and the roles of both parents and children. Thank you. Uh, and I think we have time for some questions. Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, so, so the question is about how uh, in the Sea of Monsters, Grover actually becomes Penelope. He's, he's stuck on uh, Polyphemus on the Cyclops' island, and uh, the poly Polyphemus believes that Grover is a female Cyclops, and Grover has tricked him by saying, uh, you know, just wait until my wedding veil is done, uh, is done, and then I'll marry you. And every night, Grover unravels what Grover's been... Um, been weaving. And so the question is, do, does this mean that uh, uh, Percy and the rescue party is Odysseus and that Polyphemus becomes the Cyclops? And I would say yes. And I, uh, this is one of the things that I, I find most fascinating about uh, the Percy Jackson and the Olympian series and then the, the second series, the Heroes of Olympus, is this pastiche that Royden creates. And so in, in the series, he'll borrow from the same myth over and over again, and it gets different iterations. So I think that in this case, Gabe is the suitors, and then Polyphemus becomes the suitors. And it has just a slightly different feel and context because it's a friend rescuing rather than a parent-child relationship. It's a, about two friends. And um, I, well, I hesitate to call Royden a genius, but I think this is, this is one of the, the, the most interesting elements of his work is the way that he'll reuse that theme just, or, or reuse the, the moment in classical literature for a different purpose. And, and I think that it's a fairly common practice for him that you could say, oh, he does this here, and then he does it here as well. Okay. Oh, Dr. Rosinski. Right. Questionable, and I agree. So uh, the question is about uh, whether it's nice that Percy doesn't get the blame for killing Smelly Gabe, but instead the blame is put onto his mother Sally. And I, I do think that he that he does this, and and I agree um, that this is an incredibly androcentric work, and that women get the blame over and over again. But I think that um, what what in Royden's mind makes that okay is that Gabe has been beating Sally. And I think that that's the one thing that he mentions it twice in the, in the final, uh, well, in the penultimate chapter, that um, Gabe, Gabe has been physically violent towards her. And so I think that the one thing that sort of salvages her, and I agree that it is ethically complicated, and that when, she, when, when Percy says, you know, she found the courage to finally do it, like, well, what kind of courage is that really? Um, you know, she held up a head and turned him to stone. It's not, it, it, she doesn't leave, right? Um, but I think the thing that, that sort of makes it a little more ethically acceptable is that she's defending herself, that, that there is that physical abuse. And I agree, she could just walk out. Um, but then where would she get the money to go to college? <laughs> but, right. Right. 
Right. Right, right, absolutely. I, I completely agree. And so I think that it, like, it's a problematic corrective. <laughs> that, it, that if that were, um, that it, you know, it's, it's a nice corrective, but then at the same time, it's, it's a really troubling one. And what's funny to me, I don't know how many of you have seen the film, uh, but Royden had nothing to do, do with the film. And in the film, Sally actually isn't the one who kills Gabe, that um, Percy puts the head of Medusa in the refrigerator, and he leaves a note that says, never open the refrigerator. Um, and so, I, so it's a, it was an interesting moment, because the first time that I saw the film, I really thought like, oh my gosh, they've deprived Sally of this. But then, as I started thinking about it, I really began to like that better, because I think that, um, I think that it's Percy's job, really. Um, that, that he's the, uh, yeah. I think it's Percy's job that he shouldn't put it off on his mother.